Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, good morning. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, my name is Emma. Um, a little bit about me, uh, why I would think that I could talk about this subject. Well, for one, I actually went to school for history uh, about eight years ago, but you know, it, it's still in the back of my mind all the time. Uh, it still rattles up in there. Uh, and when I was studying for my senior thesis, I studied the terror of the French Revolution, which also resulted in my professor taking me aside, asking me if I was doing okay, uh, which is kind of a question to be asked when you're doing 30 pages of research. It's like, should I not be okay? Uh, anyway, how is everyone doing today? Of all the things you could be doing this Saturday morning, you're choosing to talk, to listen to me talk about the French Revolution and Lady Oscar. So joke's on you. I hope that considering this, that everyone had a good sleep, a nutritious breakfast, maybe some hash browns. If you eat breakfast, that which is also the most important meal of the day, and that your juice is cold and your coffee is hot. And I'll leave some time at the end for any questions and commentary. I'm super excited to share some of my passions with y'all. So let's get to it, shall we? So we're going to start this discussion by looking into the series itself, Lady Oscar, The Rose of Versailles. So this series was written, illustrated by Ryoko Aikita. And also I want to give a uh, apology in advance if I mispronounce anything. It is 11 o'clock in the morning. I woke up about eight. Uh, so my brain is still firing here. And was originally serialized from 1972 to 1973 in the magazine of Margaret. It was created as a story about revolution, uprisings, and the increase of populist influence in Japan. And also, I want to say that I love that some of the panels yesterday focused on 1960s in Japan and also the lost decade of shoujo. And now I'm coming in hot with the 70s and Lady Oscar, which was very, very revolutionary for the time. Aikida herself became involved in the Communist Party of Japan in the 60s. And the New Left of Japan movement in the 60s had many similarities with the French Revolution, probably not as insane as the French Revolution, uh, to my knowledge, uh, but it also inspired the manga. And the series was a massive shift in the shoujo manga medium, the, the lost decade that we discussed yesterday, and included complex narratives, politics, and sexuality. Influences seen in shoujo series of more modern era, like uh, the revolutionary Earl Utena, um, which is also one of my favorite series. Um, and the shift caused shoujo mediums to be directed towards an audience of adolescents and younger women rather than young girls. Also noted, is that the shift in show nature of shoujo is especially seen in regards to character death. Uh, whereas many series, especially the shoujo medium, frequently call back deceased characters, either bringing them back or otherwise reincarnated. Um, this is not the case in Lady Oscar. Obviously, it's dealing with the French Revolution. If someone dies, they die. Um, which is actually a little bit refreshing in a way to me. Moving on, uh, as you can see, the Rose of Versailles has been very influential uh, in many series. Uh, you see in the series such as Pokemon, you have Jesse uh, lady wearing the outfit of Lady Oscar and James dressing up as Marie Antoinette. And also as a cross crossover episode with Lupin the Third. So the story is set in France before and during the French Revolution. Oscar, Francois de Georges, and Marie Antoinette are the series' primary characters. Um, much of the series is about Oscar's growing awareness of France's poor and the ways in which France is governed, both its successes and its obvious failures. Um, it is considered a classic in the shoujo genre. It was the medium's first commercial success. A lot of the themes and motifs of the female knight, prince, gender, and sexuality are also seen in series in more modern uh, current eras. But it was really the starting point for all of this. Mm 
now that we have gone over Lady and Oscar, let's start getting into the nitty gritty and the good stuff for French Revolution. Now, there is a lot to this particular point in history, so it was really tough to condense it uh, into an hour and a select number of slides. But, you know, I really tried here, my friends. Um, really, really tried. <laughs> the French Revolution spanned from 1789 to 1850. Its four phases were the liberal phase, the radical phase, the directory phase, and the Napoleonic phase. Uh, and you have your spans of time. As you can see, the shortest is being the radical, and we will get into that later, um, as that is probably my most, uh, most uh, knowledge is in that part of the French Revolution. And France was bankrupt at the time during the revolutionary's beginnings. And it, this was mainly because repeated policies and procedures that alienated any that could have assisted with the monarchy's issues, uh, i.e. unfair tax exemptions. The economic crisis was also due in part to them intervening in the American Revolution. Also, and some other driving forces were poverty, enlightenment ideas, and discrimination against the bourgeoisie. Enlightenment ideas would be including the ideas of John Locke, Voltaire, and Rousseau, all writers that had very detailed ideas and reasonings as to why humans are the way that they are, and in various ways as to why they need governing. And here we have one of the most famous paintings of the time period, representing the time period, Liberty Leading the People by Eugene Delacroix in 1830. I'm sure most people have seen that painting. So now that we have the ground base for what even started this madness, uh, we are starting to see the French congregate themselves to try to make some change by first getting the Estates General together. Um, and this group is so named for representing all the people of France, or so they say all the people of France, so the clergy, the nobility, and the commoners. And they're meeting for the first time in over 175 years, and they take what is called the tennis court oath. And it sounds exactly what it Sounds like uh, they met in a tennis court and took an oath to vote to not separate or reassemble until a constitution is established. And this was important because it signified the first times that citizens stood formally in opposition to the king. And in doing so, they wrote over 60,000 grievances of the king. Um, I can't even think of anyone that I would have really 60,000 grievances of, and I can be pretty petty. So that's pretty alarming with how many, what, what could they write 60,000 grievances for? I, I have no idea. Um, and among this, they were demanding a constitution that would limit the powers of the king and create a system of laws to have natural, national representation with the right to authorize taxation. After this was written, after these were given, I guess, uh, the Estates General was renamed to the National Assembly to take responsibility from the king. And the first president was Jean Sylvain Bailey. And this period of time absolutely did not last long. I saw, I see, like, I look down for a second, I see, gonna cancel the king. Uh, yeah, essentially, it gets even worse. <laughs> But the canceling gets pretty, pretty bad. Um, after uh, the National Assembly is named, we have the fall of the Bastille. Um, and this was not seen at the time as the founding event of the revolution, but has been since developed by historians and such. It was on July 14th of 1789. Um, and this was a big, big deal because the Bastille was seen as a symbol of the monarchy's abuse of power, as it was a prison in Paris. Um, and I think they only had about like six prisoners in there at the time. And this is a giant prison, but they only had very few people. And the crowd at first was initially small and relatively non-threatening until it grew. Gunshots were fired and the crowd broke into a mob. 
And after the buildings fall, members of the nobility begin to flee the country, and the news of such insurrection began to spread throughout France. Um, so we really start seeing the quote unquote common people start to band together and realize that what they're going through is absolute crap. The fall of the Bastille eventually leads the National Assembly to needing to write some sort of declaration in order to create, well, some order. What they came up with was the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which was drafted in August of 1789 and included universal male voting suffrage, but not women, and included some uh, vernacular, like men are born and remain free and equal in rights, and also included laws of expression of general will. And here on the right, you have your uh, rep an image of the meeting of the States General when they're writing 60,000 grievances of the King. Uh, I'm sure that this is exactly what happened. So what began as a peaceful revolution began to spiral quickly out of control following the, the fall of Bastille and the Declaration of the Rights of Man. Um, so it has seen that per that year, we have a pretty significant event happen. So we have the decree banning closed religious orders and the suppression of the salt tax. Um, any food taxes or any thing involving the lack of said food, like salt or wheat or like rain, is not really a good sign. If that goes up in price, especially bread, assume that things are going to hit the fan. And because of all this change happening in 1791, we are starting to see a pretty important figure come into power. His name is Maximilien Robespierre. Now, Robespierre was a lawyer, and he was a fairly good one at that, but he was something of an anomaly. He wasn't particularly loud with speaking and was generally seen as a more introverted person. He had quite a few health problems throughout his life and he stayed single. However, he was coming into power because he was adamant in what he believed in and was fairly good at pe convincing people. Because of this, he's, he's becoming a nat central figure to the National Assembly and is beginning to exclude deputies and the like from the organization. And during this year, the key king attempts to flee the country because he's being said canceled, but it ultimately failed and he was brought back to the people and then the first constitution was written. However, the first constitution was absolutely more moderate and gave more rights to the king than what was desired by um, most of the people of the country and thus more state changes were seen to as being needed. And then the 17, in 1792, the National Assembly becomes the National Convention. And we are quickly moving into the radical phase where the proverbial crap hits the fan. Here are some more images. We had the storming of the Bastille by Jean-Pierre Polnareff with an asterisk, not to be confused with this guy, Jean-Pierre Polnareff of JoJo's. Uh, we have an image of the tennis court oath. And also a really good uh, image to kind of show how the three estates worked, uh, different levels of French society before the revolution. So you have your third estate, which is the most common and the biggest portion. So everyone else is peasants, uh, they're poor, they farm the land. You have your second estate, that's your nobles, the rich, they fight for king. You have your first estate, that's the clergy. They're rich, they pray to God. And you have the king who is appointed by God. He is very rich. He rules over everyone. I liked that image because I think with a lot of people, when they see the three estates, that they might think that it's pretty even, like 33, 33, 33%, and that's just not the case. So as mentioned previously, we are moving into the radical phase. And here is where you have John Mulaney saying, I try to stay optimistic, even though I will admit things are getting pretty sticky. Because in around August 1792, King Louis XVI, he's in prison after that failed escape from the country. And then eventually he is condemned to death in January 1793. And the king's trial was barely even a month long. And the changes of the revolution had made capital punishment equal for all, even the monarchy. 
The king was charged and tried for high treason, which considering its severity in criminal law would likely take longer than a month to convince someone of, considering all the general constitutional requirements for a treason conviction. But they didn't care about that. They're like a month long, whatever. Uh, obviously not a failed trial. How much of a trial do you need if there are 60,000 charges against you? Listen, those are grievances. <laughs> <laughs> Those were just uh, hot takes against him. Uh, but, I, you know, maybe they used that in court. And in April 1793, the Committee of Public Safety is created. And I love that name, uh, Committee of Public Safety, because they are really what started all of this madness. And it really was not safe at all. However, Maximilian Robespierre is named its leader. And it was formed as provisional government in France and contained many differing ideological factions um, that we're going to see below. And the new constitution was proclaimed in 1793 of June. After that, after that new constitution, the reign of terror begins. <laughs> this is where we get fun. Those ideological factions that I said mentioned before originating from the revolution itself, they're quickly turning on each other. And this is causing a political purge. You have your left-wing factions, which are radical and moderate, and you also have your right-wing factions, which are the monarchists and conservatives. Those, the right-wing factions, those were the first on the literal chopping block. Um, <laughs> which, man, that's a pretty dark thing to say. <laughs> so, what was Robespierre's end game when it came to starting the terror? He wanted a republic of virtue. Um, he wanted to completely replace the old regime. And this would be done by a complete overhaul of societal norms at the time. Like I said, he truly believed in what he was doing. He was following the works of Rousseau's social contract, which the government should be an instrument of the general will and not built on individualism. And this applied with the fact that all capital punishment was equal for all. <laughs> You're not an individual. Everyone can get killed by the guillotine. And no, because of this, no one was particularly safe from what was called the national razor. I mean, the king and queen themselves were condemned to death by the guillotine. Um, and that being the instrument primarily used during the terror for execution means. If you thought we were done talking about the reign of terror, you're sadly mistaken. Um, even though it's only two years, whew, it, was, it was the time to be had. Um, so the revolutionaries dismantled the system of law that they had created. Uh, like I said, they sought to rid the old regime completely. Uh, various things were changed to get rid of the old regime. You had dechristianization. Robespierre introducing the Festival of the Supreme Being. You have the introduction of decimal time. Uh, that being redoing the way that they kept time with the introduction of the French decimal clock. Uh, even the calendar was changed. They changed it to the French Republican calendar. Uh, this was to increase productivity with work weeks and listed 1792 as year one and months were named after natural occurrences. And the rape, <laughs> even despite these changes, the reign of terror was essentially madness. It was a mob mentality. I mean, you can see that in this image right here. Uh, such a mob mentality and people turning on each other with swiftness and ease. Um, to me, it is arguably humanity at its worst, but also what could be its rawest form. Um, because you had over 40,000 people that were killed by the guillotine publicly uh, as a means of political purge. If you were against the terror in any way, uh, if you advocated for the end of the terror, if you were not seen as radical enough, you were guillotined. And 40,000 is a very, very generous number. Uh, the actual statistic is not known. Uh, most people were not given the right to a fair trial, if even a trial, uh, they were just executed. And the terror ended between July and August, with the biggest turn of the century, Robespierre being himself executed. 
<laughs> he kept pushing for more and more people within the community itself to be committee itself to be condemned to death, citing that these people do not believe or want the country of France to progress in the way that it should. And people had enough of that point. <laughs> so they were like, get rid of this man. <laughs> get rid of this baby man. All his photos, he looks ridiculous. Like he just looks like a small baby man. <laughs> So it's like, how did you create such madness in such a short period of time? But they they had had enough at that point, and then we see the end of the terror. <laughs> Wait a minute, he's he's sus, yeah. Being that the series doesn't go beyond 1794, we'll only briefly touch on the latter phases. Uh, these being the directory phase from 1795 to 1799 um, and the Napoleonic phase from 1799 to 1815. Uh, so you have your directory phase and the directory replaces the national convention and a new constitution is adopted. If you're keeping track, I believe that is three or four at this point. Um, I've even lost track. Like when I was doing my research, I lost track of how many times things changed. It's like, no wonder it was madness because no, what was happening? <laughs> the new constitution called for an upper and lower house of parliament based on the British and American models of government and the executive directory of five members. And this was put into effect in 1795. However, grain supplies are exhausted and food riots are common. Like I said, once grain is out, if it, Prices and price, so it's it's madness. And then we're starting to see the rise of Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, who was named commander in chief of the Army of Interior, and eventually named commander of the Army of Italy after beginning a campaign of, campaign of victories in Italy and Austria. A reminder that Austria was previously in a peaceful treaty with France until after the death of Marie Antoinette. And we'll get into that when we talk about the characters. Um, Bonaparte is such a big part of French history. Uh, I mean, with that painting right there, you could see him from space. Uh, I don't know anybody alive that could wear an all orange outfit, but there's Napoleon Bonaparte doing it. And that's probably why we're starting to lead to the Napoleonic phase, 1799 to 1815. Uh, you had your coup d'etat of November 9th to 10th. Then this involved French troops being loyal to Bonaparte, occupying key points of Paris. Now Bonaparte himself is named commander-in-chief of the Army of Paris. So he's controlling so many, so many uh, armies at this point. And members of the directory at that point, they're like, I'm out. And they either offer their resignations or are arrested. Bonaparte speaks after obtaining control of Paris, explaining the need for the change of government, another one, and the upper council votes without opposition and approval of Bonaparte. And in December of 1799, the constitution of year eight is adopted. Bonaparte is named as first consul, who eventually becomes emperor of the French from 1804 to 1814. And here we have some images of Bonaparte and one of his uh, Generals Andre Massana by Antoine Gros, Jean Gros, an outfit looked familiar, very much looks like Lady Oscar's outfit. Uh, I did see a comment, uh, being emperor just so no one can critique, <laughs> critique your outfits. Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty valid reason. <laughs> so now that we've gone over the French Revolution and an incredibly, incredibly rapid time, uh, we're going to start getting into the characters of Lady Oscar. And we're going to talk about whether they are real or fictional. Starting with Oscar Francois de Jarget, who is the bodyguard to Marie Antoinette and commander of the Royal Guard. Oscar is based off a French general under Napoleon Bonaparte, who also took part in storming the Bastille. And his name is Pierre Augustin Houdin. Um, and as I mentioned before, in the last slide, we had that general looking very dapper in his uniform and that uniform being very similar to Oscar's. And that would be probably to me, one of the petty 
petty inaccuracies that I noticed in the series and his very picky details. Oscar's uniform is actually seen more in the Napoleonic era uh, and not the early French Revolution. But that's just the only nuance. And everyone's just like, I'm going to shut up. Uh, we, <laughs> it's not that big of a deal as I push my glasses up my face. Like, I'm um, actually. So Oscar is fictional, but she is based off of a real person. She is the main character of the anime. She's not the main character of the manga, but we see it through her eyes. Um, like I said, a lot of the story is her noticing the failures and the successes of the monarchy at the early parts of the French Revolution and during. And like I mentioned, she's the daughter guide to Marie Antoinette. Marie Antoinette is married to Louis XVI to seal an alliance between Austria and France and eventually becomes the Queen of France. And she is very much non-fictional. Uh, Marie Antoinette is 14 when the series begins and Consider this when you think that she was married off to seal an alliance. Uh, 14, 14 is very, very young. Now I had my first boyfriend at 14, and <laughs> that, that would have been bad for everybody. The series does seem to humanize her more than many of other depictions in history. Because, and in, I like it because in The Rose of Versailles, She's generally depicted as an unremarkable person who just has an accidental encounter of fate. Um, whereas history often paints her as an insensitive and non-caring royal. For instance, it is unsure and likely untrue that she pulled a Lucille Bluth and said, let them eat cake. I hope everyone likes that meme. <laughs> I mean, it's one cake, Michael. What could it cost? Ten dollars? She was mainly misguided. Uh, and this is depicted in the series um, many times. And other things about her are also true, uh, like her lonely marriage with the king, um, her contention with Madame du Barry, her friendship with the Duchess, and the affair of the diamond necklace and love for person. Another character you have is Andre Grandier, who is a friend of Oscar and grew up together as children and described as a true working class hero by our very own Helen McCarthy, who is after on after me, and that is terrifying. And she also has the dream job of anime scholar. Uh, what I would not give, <laughs> what I would give <laughs> to be able to have that. Uh, he is fictional. He is also used to drive the story, much like Oscar is. Um, and then they end up professing their love, and yay! And it doesn't end up as a yay. <laughs> but I don't want to spoil much of the story. Most of what I'm going to talk about can't be considered a spoiler because it did happen in history, but I won't get into a lot of the parts that were used to drive it uh, that weren't real. You had Rosalie La Morlier. I took six years of French and I'm hesitating to pronounce these. Uh, she is the adopted daughter of Nicole La Morlier and is helped by Oscar. She has taught the art of fencing and courtly skills, uh, developing a love for Oscar, and she did serve the queen as a servant. Um, Rosalie does narrate the end of the series of the French Revolution uh, to conclude the story, and, but it is actually unknown in history what she looked like. I have this image right here um, that is believed to be her, uh, but the only portrait of her that is known to be painted has been lost. And the other painting right here was done in the 19th century by Tony Robert Fleury. And he had never actually seen her. Um, so I don't really know how this man could have painted that. But whatever, he was just going for it. He was going for it. And I respect that. Another person we have, a main character, um, we have Hans Axel von Fersen, who's the Swedish aristocrat, who becomes involved in a romance with Maria Antoinette. He is absolutely non-fictional. However, I do love the shoujo version of him as compared to the actual version of him. Uh, <laughs> look at that dream boat. Uh, I love the wigs uh, of the French Revolution and just that time period itself is so awesome. So those are your main characters of the Rose of Versailles. Uh, as you can see, most of them are non-fictional with only a couple that are fictional. 
And then we have most of the minor characters here. They are royal or nobility and based off of French personages. You have King Louis XVI, who is the king of France after the passing of his grandfather, King Louis the XV. He notably doesn't do much for France and further breaks down the country's economic state. Eventually, during the revolution, he tries to escape from France, but fails and is later executed. We have King Louis XV, who is an, the active king at the start of the series. By the way, King Louis XV is called the Playboy King of France. Because uh, look at that robe right there. Isn't that awesome? I would definitely go for that. Not really. Uh, he dies with smallpox in the Palace of Versailles. Uh, but he is in the first couple of episodes, and he he plays a central role in the story between Marie Antoinette and Madame du Barry. But other than that, again, there isn't a whole lot that he does for the country of France. The, his uh, prior one, King Louis XIV, the Sun King, uh, he is much more notable in actually driving the country to success. But uh, King Louis XV and King Louis XVI, not so much. So many historical hotties, that's why I studied history. Madame du Barry is the last mistress of the king before he dies and was not born a noble. It is noted that many of the first few episodes focus on the contention between Madame du Barry and Marie Antoinette, who would not address the former due to her status as a previous prostitute and current mistress to the king. Scandalous. This results in the Queen of Austria, Maria Therese, to advise her daughter to address Dubarry in order to not start a war between the two countries. And I realize this sounds utterly ridiculous, but it is absolutely real, and I will talk about it uh, in more depth uh, in a few minutes. And after the king passes, Dubarry is exiled to a convent, and she is later guillotined. Do you see a theme here? You see a theme. Most people are on uh, a, they have to get their heads chopped off. Um, we have the Duke of Orleans, the cousin of King Louis XVI, who tried to steal the throne, and he is second in line. He also created a plot to kidnap Marie Antoinette at the start of the series, but he failed. He also tried to kill his own cousin by switching a hunting rival with a faulty one. He is just a right douche. He had a hand in helping with the affair of the diamond necklace by helping Jean escape to a convent uh, escape from a convent and cover the expenses of her publication that would eventually ruin the queen. You have the Duchess of Pognac, who is a singer of Versailles and becomes close to Marie Antoinette, but not with pure intentions. She convinces the queen to start gambling. She manipulated her and made the queen believe that lying about a pregnancy even would fix her problems. That doesn't work. Absolutely doesn't work. Don't do that. And she has a daughter that she tries marrying off to the Duke de Goyche, or I call it Duke de Douche. <laughs> Mind you, her daughter is 11, and the Duke is in his 40s. That episode is extremely hard to watch, uh, as just a mention, and she is just not a very good mother for doing that at all. There is also a pretty heavy twist in her story in regards to Rosalie. Again, anything that is fictional, um, that is used to drive the story, I will not go into in depth because I don't want to spoil anything. You have Jean of uh, Blois saint remy and she is the quote unquote sister of Rosalie. That is fictional. Uh, and she, at the start of the series, runs away from home and weasels her way into the household of a noble by using the fact that she is a descendant of noble blood. She also does this by like running in front of a carriage and then flopping. Um, which, I mean, that would get anybody's attention. And her relationship to Rosalie, as mentioned, is purely fictional and used to move the story. However, she does play a huge role in the destruction of the Queen's reputation, which we'll get more into depth. Um, and also, Maximilian Robespierre, who we talked about before, head of the terror, head of the community public safety. Oscar does meet him while she's suspended from her duties on the countryside, and that is when she is really starting to be exposed to the rhetoric against the royal family. Again, baby man. That man led the terror. Let that sink in. You already ruined that Rose Pierre died. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> what did I do? So what are some of the biggest plot movers of the Rose of Versailles that are entirely real, you may ask? 
I had mentioned previously the, say, the taste, this taste between Madame du Barry and Marie Antoinette. Hold on, I'm going to take a drink of water here. Their relationship was contentious from the get-go, and this is adequately displayed in the first few episodes in which the characters are even in introduced. It also feels fictional with how petty it was. The two met during a family dinner on May 15th, 1770, a day before Marie Antoinette was married. And at that point, DuBerry had been only an official mistress for over a year. Marie Antoinette was informed of the role of Madame DuBerry. And this sparked an in, like, instant hatred. By the way, Marie Antoinette being 14 at the time had to be informed what exactly it meant to give pleasure to the king. And that, that did not sit well with this woman. Um, Marie Antoinette, after that, she refused to speak to Madame DuBerry, defying court protocol. Because in order to speak to the queen, DuBerry would have to be addressed by her. And this did not sit right with the king's, king's mistress. The ways that the king attempted to change uh, Marie Antoinette's way after Madame DuBerry eventually complained to the king um, were trying to reach out to Marie Antoinette's mother, the Queen of Austria. This feud almost destroyed the alliance that France and Austria had developed with the queen of Marie Antoinette to Louis XVI. And eventually on New Year's Day, 1772, Marie Antoinette spoke indirectly to DuBerry. She spoke during a ball on New Year's Day, saying there are many people in Versailles today. <laughs> See what I did there? <laughs> they, <laughs> <laughs> giving DuBerry the option to respond or not. This ends up in a lot of emotional turmoil depicted in the series for Marie Antoinette, who feels as though she compromised her morals. And the two women, even so far as to try to bring Oscar's mother into the fray, naming her as the lady in waiting to either the mistress or the queen, whose Oscar mother chose to play this role, would also show Oscar's alliance, therefore involving her into the feud. Because at first, Oscar was like, I'm just going to watch what what, what happens here and then that happens and Oscar is literally like I just came here to have a good time and I'm obviously feeling so attacked right now these episodes feel very shoujo series esque when you take away the most of it was entirely true and things like the emotions at hand and Oscar's involvement were fictional to drive the story a scene that I do like however during this portion I wish I had the technological know how to be able to like show it um is an excellent use of foreshadowing because during a fit of rage, DuBerry knocks over multiple bus statue, statues in the uh, in the palace and they all break at the neck. Looky there. And they have these images of Madame DuBerry being very, very shoujo like a Kill Bill Sirens playing in the background. I also mentioned previously a huge plot mover is the affair of the diamond necklace. So in 1772, Louis XV requested that jewelers Bamer and Bassans create a necklace for Madame du Barry. And here's some things about, to note about this necklace. First of all, this image right here, this is a reconstruction of it. It's not the actual one. Um, it was estimated to cost at least 2 million livres and was not completed or paid for when Louis XV passed away. And apparently it was offered to Marie Antoinette, but she refused. Uh, and it was offered multiple times. And she was like, we need more ships than this necklace. Uh, so it's what she said. But people really don't really believe that she refused it because she also had some champagne taste going on. So in comes good old Jean, because this ends up creating a huge mess for the queen. So Jean becomes a mistress of the Cardinal de Rohan, who is a former French ambassador to the court of Vienna, Austria, irony. And the Cardinal was not seen in good favor by the queen. So he was trying to regain said favor to become one of the king's ministers. So Jean, being the con artist that she is, told him that she had been received by the queen. So the Cardinal used this to his advantage. However, Jean created a false correspondence between the cardinal and she herself was posing as the queen in their letters. And this convinced the cardinal that the queen was in fact love with them. But during this time, Jean took advantage 
of the Colonel, but also by borrowing large sums of money, telling them that they were for charity work to use this money to help with buying the necklace from the jewelers. An eventual fake order was written by Jane to the Cardinal, and Rohan eventually negotiated the price of the necklace with the jewelers in secret, and that too was going to be paid in installments, claiming to have the Queen's authorization. It did not. Rohan took the necklace to Jane's house and gave it to Arando, who he thought was the valet to the Queen, and the necklace was picked apart and sold off to black markets in London and Paris. That is why we have the image of a reconstruction. So what happened after that? The jewelers eventually complained to the queen who told them that they, she had neither received nor ordered the necklace. She had no idea what was going on. And the car, this controversy led to the arrest of the Colonel, Jean, and the accomplices involved. Despite the findings that Marie Antoinette was absolutely innocent in this matter, the public of France had already had strong opinions about Marie Antoinette, and they persisted that the queen had used Jean as an instrument to satisfy her hatred of the cardinal and further impress an image of her as a manipulative spender more interested in vanity and money. One of the reasons for this is that Jean actually, um, when she was arrested and then charged and put in prison, she escaped the prison that was all women, she disguised herself as a dude, and she escaped, and then she published a book basically saying that she was manipulated by the queen to do this. Um, and the French people bought it. So Jean is just, she's just a party of a person. Uh, she did really get girl boss her way into riches. Yes, yeah, she did. She did not give up. She did not care about anybody else but herself. And the affair was important discrediting the Bourbon monarchy in the eyes of the French people, further destroying Marie Antoinette's reputation. Uh, I mean, Marie Antoinette was one of the main symbols, symbolize, symbols to symbolize the lavishness and corruption of a dying regime and served as a scapegoat for the revolution to come. This is an image down here. Somebody actually drew this. This is just, this is, just awful. Um, they put her head on a beast, and I don't know what this beast is. Like, it looks... Can, can anyone in the chat tell me what that is? Because it looks like half a dog, half a pig, donkey. Uh, you have, like, these weird little like, antenna thing? It's a chimera? Yeah. It's her fursona. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That's what they were doing. So just awful here. And again, we have this beautiful, beautiful necklace. Uh, it's a little too flashy for my taste, but that is the reconstruction of what it looked like. So transitioning now to the end, we've made it folks. We've made it. Uh, and what are some of my final thoughts on the French Revolution? So if you're able to sit down and take time to research the subject, I highly recommend it. Um, there are several things about the time period that can resonate today. Uh, and it's also just a very interesting point of history to truly see how humanity functions at both its best and its worst. So I say that because you did see the quote unquote common people rise up against the king for the first time. And also you had the terror happen. So it was two sides of a coin. Um, in my opinion, the French Revolution is far more interesting than the American Revolution. The uh, American Revolution is pretty cut and dry to me. Um, there were a lot more ideological factors at play that ended up determining how the country is governed, but also demonstrated people's ability to rise when it is needed. Uh, there is so much more that can be said about this time period than I could possibly fit into an hour um, or less. And so I do apologize if certain things were not maybe you had questions that might not have been answered at the time. Um, however, I am so, so passionate about this time period. Um, I find it so interesting. So please reach out if you have any questions or if you are interested into researching more uh, and would like any recommendations on books, videos, et cetera. Uh, I have read so many books on this. Um, so I'd be able to lead you in the right direction. And my opinion on the Rose of Versailles, to me, as you can see, 
most of what I talked about were historically accurate with a few plot movers that were fictional. Um, so because of that, to me, it's one of the most historically accurate and therefore compelling pieces of fictional work I've probably ever consumed. It got so much right with only minor things like the outfits that may be questioned uh, as being in the wrong time period. So honestly, if you're not interested in studying the French Revolution in depth, because, oh my God, it is quite the subject to consume, we would like a general overview while taking in a deep and fascinating storyline. The Rose of Versailles is the way to go. It is also stunningly gorgeous and is now officially out on Blu-ray in two parts, thanks to Discotech. Uh, please, please, please pick that up if you're interested uh, and support them and also support this wonderful series. I highly recommend picking it up for any collection and giving it a watch. You won't regret it. However, I do have to say and suggest that if you are interested, that there are a number of plot lines and themes that may be prove disturbing to some viewers, so exercise caution. Also, I'd be willing more to talk about that in depth. Um, just message me privately if you would like. Uh, last but not least, I want to extend my deepest gratitude and thanks to everyone that showed up today. There are several of my friends and family watching, including my parents, uh, who I can assure you all are very proud that this is the first time I'm using my degree in about eight years. Um, trust me, I was so floored uh, that my panel had so much interest from the beginning when I posted on Twitter asking if people were interested at all. And this is my very, very first one ever that I've ever done. Um, turns out every single one of you is a history nerd. So thank you to everyone also that took the time to look over my panel content and grammar. And thanks to the guys running Anime Lockdown again for the second year. Um, and that is all. You also have my contact information. As you can see, I am Lady Wolf in the Twitch chat. I'm just as feral in real life as I am in the chat. So there you have it, folks. That was incredible. <laughs> Thank you. So am I to understand that you wrote this panel for Anime Lockdown? Or did you just have it and you were waiting for the right time? I wrote it for Anime Lockdown. Actually, there is kind of a story about this. I um, posted on Twitter to see if people would be interested in it. Um, and I got some resounding response. And this was about the week before I was about to move. And I started writing it. Then I moved from my apartment to my condo. And it was a nightmare. Oh. Nightmare move. And I'm working on it. I submitted my panel the day I moved. Oh, geez. Like 1130 at <laughs> night. And it wasn't even finished. So I have been working on it pretty much ever since trying to get it where I want it to be. So yeah, it was about a, a three week long uh, piece of work and I, I'm really happy with how it came out. You, you wouldn't be the first panelist to finish their panel right before they go on. So I wouldn't feel too <laughs> bad about that. Which I should know better than to do that. I was like, you know, I, I, it took me months to write that thesis. Why am I doing this? <laughs> There uh, are many instances of me in the hotel right before my panel finally putting my slides together. <laughs> yes, hastily do it. Like yesterday, I messaged my friend Drew and I was like, not me trying to put my like contact information on there because I forgot it. <laughs> um, did you want to see if the chat had any questions? You have about 10 more minutes. Yeah, uh, of course. Um Please let me know if you have any questions. I'll try my best uh, to answer them. I'll give it a couple seconds to catch up to the yeah. Twitch delay. I Do my parents know about my hash pound crimes too? No. But <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I heard that you're the person that started the hash brown incident. Yeah, I was. Because <laughs> I was working and I did sell to a customer 84 cases of hash browns. Oh, <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> that's, um, that's, that's a big number of potatoes. Yeah, yeah. I think I mentioned that I sold 500 pounds of cheese to a customer before, too. So Lord. It was you. Yeah, it was me. <laughs> it was I that set the house ablaze. <laughs> to the guillotine. Uh, yeah, and I have a lot of feelings about the guillotine. <laughs> yeah, every, everyone now is just like, oh my God, that was you. <laughs> the 500 feet cheese. Yeah, it was real. <laughs> 
I'm I'm guessing you work at like a food distribution center or yeah, something. Yeah. You don't just have 500 pounds of cheese in your apartment. Yeah, I just have a barrel of cheese. It's, yes, it's an Etsy. Food. You're freelance. Assume when I say it, like if it's ridic- if it sounds ridiculous, assume that it's real. <laughs> That's why you had to move. You had too much cheese in your place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I had to get, get the condo to store the food. Yeah, and honestly, I probably just bought my condo for my cat and my dog. Nice. Wait, is it one dog? I thought you had two dogs. Did I misunderstand? I I, I have two dogs, uh, but my black Pomeranian, she lives with my ex. So Ah, uh, got you. Yeah. There's so much cheese in Versailles today. Uh, tell Thomas and Dapper Lad we all say hi. Dapper Lad, his name is Cranson, but he says hi. And he, uh, he looks very dapper with his tie. Yeah, if, if you're not following Emma on Twitter... Uh, there's a adorable picture of a fluffy dog wearing a tie. <laughs> and if you're not following me on Twitter and you decide to do so, I apologize. <laughs> I like I am unhinged in literally every single social media. <laughs> well, you fit right in. <laughs> he is a good pup. Uh, both the, both my dogs are very good. Any other works you want to dig into the historical context of? Um, I actually did, this is going to sound funny. I did, when I was like 17 years old, I did a paper on the historical context of Helsing. Oh, nice. Uh, with like, um, which was my first like favorite series other than like Inuyasha. Uh, Helsing was it for me when I was like 14. So I wrote a paper about um, the, all the background between the Protestant and Catholic like struggle, uh, like really went into depth with that. So maybe redoing that a lot of what, like with getting into the French revolution, this was relevant because I've actually been working on uh, rewriting my thesis and researching it more about the terror to maybe eventually get published. Uh, So I really like looking at past stuff that I've researched and seeing how my uh, years of being able to like improve on my research uh, could change things. So I say housing and I, uh, the other things like I'm not quite so sure yet. I know Lupin is a big series that I like, um, and there are some historical things in it. Like they completely bastardized the JFK assassination, but that kind of interests me too. It's trying to see like what differences are <laughs> there. I'd I'd be interested to see the um, accuracies of like uh, Rain the Conquer and actual Alexander the Great. I just watched oh, that series, yeah. and I I'm guessing that a lot of it's made up. Yeah, <laughs> um, uh, is there anything about like the Russian revolution? Because I I've done quite a bit of research on like Rasputin and stuff. I don't remember. Yeah. Uh, someone in the chat is recommending Le Chevier d'Eon. Le Chevier, oh God, it's too early for Le me. Le Chevier d'Eon, and if people want to revisit uh, pre-revolutionary France. So yeah, that would be like uh, King Louis the Fifteenth, King Louis the Fourteenth, uh, before, before things got a little out of hand. I'll write that down. I haven't actually heard of that. Wonder how many new instances of wacky Catholicism in anime have happened since the Helsing days. God, I wonder too. <laughs> Loop on the third from Siberia with love has a wonderfully accurate depiction of Rasputin. I mean, he's actually just as wild in that uh, special as he is in history. So you know, not not wrong. Question: Best Shakespeare history play. Uh, hmm. Man, are you talking like my favorite or like most historically accurate? I mean, I almost I just went off and said my favorite was Othello, but uh, best history one. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, 
I don't know. I, mean, I would have to ask my brother. My brother uh, really likes Shakespeare, so I'd have to get ask what he thinks. I actually wanted to get him a bust of William Shakespeare, and then my now sister-in-law took that idea from me, and I was like 15 at the time, and now they're married, and I still hold that. I'm oh. almost that was like 15 years ago. I still think about that. It's like she took my idea from me. <laughs> and that's Hamlet like... too. <laughs> yeah. That was, that was a very, very good Shakespeare play. Agreed. Electric. <laughs> I was waiting for that. Mm-hmm. Uh. Oh. Covering Roads of Versailles in today's Yuri Pan. Of course, I actually have that uh, written down as a reminder because I was like, oh, that probably has both Roads of Versailles and Revolutionary Girl Utena caught me in. <laughs> it was a uh, by luck that these panels lined up this way. I just put people in order of their availability and, uh, you know, it worked out. Yeah, no, like when I watched the panels, like I said, the 1960s Japan uh, history with the beginning uh, that I focused on with the author and then um, uh, the lost generation of shoujo, like seriously, it was perfect. <laughs> and then, yeah, we have Yuri panels and stuff. It's great. I mean, I, I did it on purpose. I'm super yeah. genius. This <laughs> was, was my plan all along. <laughs> Someone said Hamlet 2 sounds like a straight-to-DVD Disney sequel. <laughs> Mulan 2. <laughs> By the way, Mulan is not historically accurate, if you're wondering. But it was based on a legend during the Han Dynasty, so there is that. Well, we've got a couple more minutes. Um, if you want to hang out, you're welcome to. If you want to... Uh, Peace out a couple minutes early. That's it's up to you. I prefer yeah, Hamlet I four. I will peace out. I'm probably gonna get uh, some donuts here. Oh, that sounds pretty good. I have donut holes. So thanks everyone for watching again, and I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your day. Well, cheers. Thank you so much for joining us. Yes. Bye bye.